Hello and welcome to Virtual Face-to-Face -face with Dr. Bruce Gerald. I'm Alex Lukowski, Executive Director of Media Relations. Today, Dr. Gerald explores a terrible side effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, rising violence against women and intensified impact on human trafficking survivors. One New York Times writer called the situation another opportunistic infection flourishing in the conditions created by the COVID-19 pandemic. In many cases, victims are in lockdown with their abusers, often so fearful of coronavirus infection, they avoid medical treatment of injuries, and others vulnerable to abuse are finding it difficult to access support services whose staff may be in lockdown at home themselves. Joining Dr. Gerald today are two prominent thought leaders in this area. Ambassador Susan Esserman founded and leads the University of Maryland Support, Advocacy, Freedom, and Empowerment, or SAFE Center, at the University of Maryland School of Health, Public Health. The SAFE Center is a project of the University of Maryland Strategic Partnership, Empowering the State, formed in 2016. It provides survivor-centered and trauma-informed services that empower trafficking survivors to heal and reclaim their lives. The SAFE Center aims to prevent trafficking and better serve survivors through research and public advocacy. Ambassador Esserman is also a partner in Steptoe & Johnson LLP, a Washington, D.C.-based international law firm, where she leads the firm's international trade policy practice and leads the firm's pro bono program on behalf of survivors of human trafficking. Nominated by President Clinton, she served as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative and also Assistant Secretary of Commerce. Ambassador Esterman is joined by Professor Lee Goodmark, the Marjorie Cook Professor of Law and co-director of the Clinical Law Program at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. Previously, Professor Goodmark was the director of the Clinical Education and Family Law Clinic and co-director of the Center of Unapplied Feminism at the University of Baltimore School of Law. And she directed the Children and Domestic Violence Project at the American Bar Association Center on Children and the Law. Among her scholarly works are two recent books, Decriminalizing Domestic Violence, A Balanced Policy Approach to Intimate Partner Violence, and A Troubled Marriage, Domestic Violence and the Legal System. Welcome to you both. Before we begin, let me say that this program is being recorded and will be posted on our COVID-19 website, umaryland.edu slash coronavirus. A little later in the program, you, the audience, will have a chance to ask questions or make comments. Here's how you do that. Look for the tools at the bottom of your screen. They're all enclosed in circles. Click on the button with the speech bubble to open the chat function. Not the Q&A function, but the chat function. Type your question there. When the time comes, we may call on you to ask your question. So please listen for your name and be ready to speak up. I'll do my best to give you a heads up by sending you a chat message in return. So please look out for that too. With all that out of the way, here's our host, UMB Interim President, Dr. Bruce Jarrell. Thank you, Alex, and welcome to all of you who are attending. I think we've got a great slate for you today to learn about this serious problem. Here we are still in the COVID crisis. We're still working at home. As you can see, I'm still at home and loving every minute of it, of course. Uh, so I, I hope that this adds a little interest to your day, interest in a very important and pressing topic uh, in this epidemic. Uh, so welcome. I'd like to begin with asking Professor Goodmark to speak just a little bit about her gender violence clinic at the Francis King Carey School of Law and, and a little bit about what she's seeing in the way of domestic virus of violence during this viral infection. Professor Goodmark. So, Dr. Gerald, thank you so much for having me. Um, the Gender Violence Clinic at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law handles cases, any kind of case where gender and violence are interacting with each other in any way. So we do a, a pretty broad range of work from immigration work to family law work to domestic violence protective orders to work with trafficking survivors. Um, and we actually do a fair amount of work with incarcerated people who have been victims of gender-based violence. So what I'm seeing is based in part on my scholarly work around the legal system's handling of intimate partner violence and partly based on uh, the experiences that our clients are having right now. So if you pick up a newspaper or any kind of publication right now, you will see a spate of articles saying domestic violence increasing during pandemic, calls to police increasing during pandemic, calls to police decreasing during pandemic. What are people doing during pandemic about domestic violence? And it's been interesting to watch the coverage because it, it reflects something that we know in the field, 
which is that it's hard to get good numbers about what's happening in intimate partner violence. There's every reason to believe that intimate partner violence would be increasing during the pandemic. A couple of the biggest correlates with intimate partner violence are both trauma and economic stress, both of which people are certainly experiencing. When you add to that what Alex mentioned about the physical proximity of people, and you put all those things together, it's, it wouldn't surprise me a bit to know that domestic violence itself is increasing. Whether that's translating to increased calls to police, whether that's translating to more prosecution is a different question altogether. Domestic violence is underreported most of the time. Only about half of the cases of violence are reported to law enforcement. And so to the extent that we're seeing uh, things dropping off, that may be because people don't necessarily want to send their loved ones into the criminal legal system, particularly knowing how rampant the virus is in those spaces. So it's a really complicated question right now. How do we find out more about that, or will time just tell? I'm not sure that we'll ever know for sure what the extent of intimate partner violence was during the pandemic. Uh, it's Most surveys ba are based on self-disclosure. Some people disclose and some people don't. We'll certainly have some sense of what the numbers were in terms of turning to law enforcement. My guess is that those numbers are going to, are going to drop, and in part that's tied to an effort around mutual aid that you're seeing in a number of communities uh, with people saying, you know, don't rely on these state based systems that may not be helpful to us right now, rely more on community, which is something that those of us in the field have been talking about for some period of time now. Thank you. Ambassador Esserman, welcome as well. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your safe center and what you're seeing out there in the field with these uh, victims of crime. Well, thank you, Dr. Gerald. It's a pleasure to participate along with Professor Goodmark. Um, at the SAFE Center, we provide, as Alex summarized, comprehensive services, research and advocacy for sex and labor trafficking survivors. By comprehensive services, I mean we provide on a bilingual basis legal, social, and crisis intervention services, uh, education, and, and uh, employment uh, services and mental health and basic medical care. Um, we have been so privileged to benefit from Empower as we've been able to draw on 10 different schools in designing our programs and our research. And we've been uh, even more privileged to have 65 students intern with us in the four years that we've been in operation. This week is literally the fourth anniversary of the opening of the center. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Gerald, for your steadfast support and commitment to the SAFE Center. You were absolutely critical to our opening and to where we are today. I would just say briefly that we, in the four years that we've been open, we've served 180 uh, victims of sex and labor trafficking and many of their family members. Um, and about 75% of the victims live or work in Maryland. So just one word about trafficking, because many people are, can, uh, don't understand it fully and don't um, appreciate how much it happens here in the United States and here in the state of Maryland. Trafficking is the criminal exploitation of women and girls and men and boys for commercial sex and forced labor. It involves the use of force, fraud, and coercion to compel a victim to work against their will, often in slavery-like conditions. And trafficking is an inherently violent phenomenon. So I would say that we're seeing three different types of effects of the COVID crisis on human trafficking victims. The first is that we're seeing from our own clients and hearing from advocates across the country about how traffickers are taking advantage of the COVID crisis to further control their clients and entrap, entrap new clients. Second, there are devastating effects on our clients because they are among 
the most vulnerable of our population. And in the safe center, uh, the largest um, segments of our population are African American and immigrant women, African American women, and, and, and immigrant women and children. And the third effect is um, the, the fact that the support network, school counselors, teachers, uh, child protective services, and other uh, service providers are not available face to face. And these, these are the three big impacts. Like, you know, if there's more time, I'd love to talk about them because um, they're very serious effects and, and um, a lot of different ways in which traffic is trying to take advantage of the situation. Thank you. Prince George's County has been hit pretty hard uh, with the COVID uh, infection uh, throughout that entire county. Your center is right there smack in the middle of Prince George's County. Uh, and so I guess if, if there's going to be an effect, you're going to be the first to see it in that particular location. Do you have any particularly uh, telling stories or, or an individual that you've dealt with recently? Well, let me just go to some stories that revolve around the effects in Prince George's County. Because the largest share of our clients come from Prince George's County. Um, and what this crisis is doing is starkly exposing the huge holes in our safety net. Um, some of our clients are facing extreme risk as essential employees going going to work in low income jobs with little protection in cleaning in construction in in the groceries one of our clients is afraid not to go to work even though he is sick with the covid because he is so desperate for income and he's afraid to lose his job even though we have been telling him there are protections for him. A number of our clients have lost their jobs and are desperately seeking shelter and food, which we're providing. And I think most sadly, many of them are not in conditions where they can social distance, living in close quarters, multi-generation families, and some of our clients living in trailers with a number of others because they can't afford other housing. And in that situation, they'd be safer going to work. So either way, they're at risk of exposure um, to COVID. And a number of them are so fearful. They have a lack of trust and they really don't understand um, all of the different things coming out in COVID. And that's why the Safe Center provided a guide um, to try to support our clients that talk about how they can stay safe, comply with the governor's and other orders, services that are available, and rights and protections for rent, uh, for unemployment insurance, and possible availability of, of rebate checks. And I just say one other thing. The increasingly harsh immigration law environment makes it even worse because it compounds their fear of coming forward, even to ask for services to an organization like ours. So those are just the, the, the economic effects that we're seeing. Thank you. Professor Goodmark, you've had a lot of interest in incarcerated women, women in prisons, uh, and I, I know you have some opinions about what's going on there relative to COVID. Could you make a few comments about that to stimulate us about it? I certainly can. Um, anybody who has ever been inside of, of a prison or a carceral facility of any kind knows that physical distancing is absolutely impossible. Our clients who are incarcerated are living two to a cell. Um, they are in close quarters with as many as 100 other people. They share showers. They share other facilities. They have to leave to get their meals. Um, it, it's simply impossible for them to be able to live in a way that keeps them safe. 
And once the virus gets inside of a penal facility, it runs rampant. We've seen that on New York's Rikers Island. We've seen that in Chicago. Uh, we've seen it in Ohio, in Louisiana. There's a women's prison with a 70% infection rate. And so we have very real concerns about clients of ours who are currently incarcerated. Uh, there's been some press recently about one of our clients, Irena Pretty. Um, Ms. Pretty is the longest serving woman in Maryland's system. She's been in the system for 42 years, for a, convicted of a, a murder, connected with a murder that her abusive boyfriend carried out. And we found out two weeks ago that Ms. Pretty had been taken out of the facility, apparently with COVID and hospitalized. We still don't know what her condition is. We still haven't been able to ascertain just what the damage was. And we've been advocating with everyone we can think of to try to help her leave that facility. For all of our older clients, particularly many of whom have medical issues already, the existence of COVID really makes their lives precarious. And so while I appreciate what the governor and others have done in, in thinking about how do we decrease capacity in the prisons, the reality is that the numbers haven't come down in the way that I think we would have liked to have seen. And the dangers in those facilities are still very real for our clients who are there. Are you able to directly interact with those individuals in person? Do you do it now by phone? What, what, so what's your connectiveness uh, to those individuals? It's very difficult to stay connected to those individuals. Um, we have, we cannot see them face to face anymore. It's not safe for them. It's not safe for us. Um, we can ask to try to have contact with them by phone, but the facilities are really stretched. Um, so many of uh, the correctional officers are ill that the facilities are on lockdown, which means that uh, people are in their cells for 23 hours a day. And that in order to get phone calls, there's a, a real series of machinations that has to happen. So unless you have a true emergency, it is very, very difficult to have a conversation with a client right now. Right. Disturbing facts, obviously. Uh, Ambassador Esserman, you have uh, you have wraparound services, and one of the services that always struck me uh, as being unique was about with Marriott International and training uh, people to get back in the workforce. So, so a company like Marriott and, and trying to attract uh, people into their industry, they're a heavy service industry. W what are you hearing about the ability of your human trafficking people or others to get back into that workforce? Anything? Well, as you know, uh, the hospitality industry is is hard hit. I think the, the national figures indicate a loss of jobs of 90% in, in that sector. It's really quite stunning. Um, but um, we, you know, we are very fortunate to be engaging in a training program with Marriott um, and uh, that it's been designed by them working with another NGO to provide training on um, job readiness and also to expose human trafficking survivors to the different kinds of jobs they could have in the hospitality industry. And right before COVID set on, we were about to launch this program. But as like most of our services, they're face-to-face in-person training. So we are working very hard to begin that training remotely um, because we think it's all the more important now that a number of our clients are out of jobs that they use this time now, that, that um, we try to engage them. But you have to be very thoughtful about how you engage them because a number of our clients do not have access to computers or sophisticated cell phones. So our first training sessions are gonna be more limited in time and done through basic cell phones. So, um, it's a wonderful program that they're partnering with us on, and we're, we're trialing this program in the hospitality sector, but hopefully to expand it um, to other sectors. It's wonderful because a job is, a, a good sustainable job is the gateway out of trafficking. All right, thank you. Professor Goodmark, you referred earlier to law enforcement and how it could be uh, harmful or helpful. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, so just by way of background, 
much of my scholarship is about the ways in which the legal system interacts with people who've experienced intimate partner violence. And I've been fairly critical of the law enforcement response to intimate partner violence along a number of dimensions. The big argument that I make in my recent book is that interventions by law enforcement aren't necessarily making people safer and, in fact, may be making them much less safe um, because they fail to deter people from engaging in further violence and because interaction with the criminal legal system actually spurs a number of the correlates of intimate partner violence. So, for example, male under and unemployment is one of the highest um, predictors of intimate partner violence. And when you have been involved with the criminal legal system, one of the things that becomes very difficult is to find and maintain employment. So the interventions that we're using to address intimate partner violence are actually driving that violence in some ways. All of this is heightened by this pandemic. So there's some, there's some kind of basic problems with law enforcement intervening at this point. Um, in most cases, when law enforcement comes to the door in a case of domestic violence, if they make an arrest, that person is going to go to central booking. They're most likely going to be charged with a misdemeanor, and they're going to be held for a number of hours, a day or two days, not very long before they're most likely going to be discharged on bail. So if they're discharged on bail, they're going back into families having been in this carceral setting where the virus is running rampant for several days. They're coming back with no deterrent back into the same fraught situation with the same people with a heightened risk of violence. None of that is particularly conducive to decreasing domestic violence. If they're denied bail, if they're held, that has economic implications for the family who may be relying on that person for economic support. It has implications for parenting. It may have implications for economic status, or I'm sorry, for immigration status. There are a number of different dimensions upon which criminalization holding the person makes the experience of the virus even more difficult. Um, and so, and that, all of that kind of ignores the role of love, um, that people love their partners and they depend upon their partners. And while they may not want them to be violent, they don't necessarily want them jailed either. Um, and so knowing that in this situation, arrest for a misdemeanor could be a death warrant you may resist calling the police, which is why people are looking for alternatives, uh, ways to do violence and eruption that are different than ensuring that somebody is going to go into the, the criminal legal system as a result. So you know, we've argued that increasing neighborhood resources, increasing community resources, providing better economic resources to families to decrease the stress that they're experiencing, ensuring that people are connected to other people, all of those things are going to help us not have to rely on the criminal legal system, particularly at this time. Yeah, we're all in that situation of wanting to rely on other people and only have to be able to do it remotely. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've argued for a number of years that we need to think about things other than the criminal legal system as being our primary response to intimate partner violence. The irony, I guess, of coronavirus is that we have the opportunity to do that. Um, because we have a situation in which if you arrest someone and you expose them to this virus, it may have consequences far beyond anything that you intended. All right. I want to remind the, the uh, watchers, the participants, that you can uh, start getting questions in now because we're, we're ready to receive your questions because the second half is really aimed at trying to address questions that you have. So uh, please send them in to uh, Alex, as he uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, oh, Alex, we have two questions, please. All right. Well, the uh, first uh, question is uh, from Stephanie Seward. Stephanie, if you're uh, if you're there, you've waited patiently. Go ahead. It may take a moment. Go ahead. You're unmuted. Well, Stephanie was asking. About uh, she said, I says I know Araminta is one resource for traffic girls, but where can we find a list of resources or organizations that provide help for trafficked persons uh, generally? Beyond that, you can find um, a list of resources through the Maryland Human Trafficking Task Force um, and through Polaris, which runs a national human trafficking hotline and coordinates a lot of services. But if you're looking for Maryland specific, they do have a directory of, of services, um, the full range of services in, 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 the, in the state. 
Okay, and we have Karen Morell. Karen. Great. Thank you guys so much for this really insightful conversation today. I really appreciate it. So my question is that the bystander effect often prevents people from wanting to intervene in domestic violence situations. And many people may also feel nervous to report concerns of domestic violence, especially if you're unsure about the specific circumstances. So how can we support our neighbors and friends in these situations where we may be uncertain about what's happening? I think one of the things to do is just to engage with people um, in kind of very basic ways to, to check in with the people that you may be concerned about, to ask them how they're doing, to try to find out if there's a way to have a confidential conversation with them. You know, that's one of the things that's so hard right now during the pandemic is that with everybody on top of each other, there are very few ways to have a private conversation about the things that are happening. But checking in with people, trying to have conversations with them, asking them if they need resources, asking them if they need, you know, not just kind of, can I point you to a, an intervention organization, but do you need dinner? Um, do you need somebody to read a book to your kids over Zoom for a little while to give you a, a minute just to kind of breathe? You know, those kinds of community check-ins give people the idea that you're someone that they can trust and rely on that may lead them to share more information with you. I think the, the one thing that I would say that concerns me is that oftentimes people meaning very, very well call the police because they don't know what else to do and they're worried. And that sets into motion a chain of events that often has real repercussions for both the victim and the person who's using violence that nobody ever intended and that the victim may not want. So I would caution people to be very, very thoughtful before you make that particular step. Other questions for this? Yes, Jody Finkelstein asks, what are the largest gaps in services that are community-based that the panelists would like to see implemented for domestic violence and trafficking victims? The largest gaps in services. Well, I, I would just say from the standpoint of trafficking, I think housing and the right kind of housing services is the biggest gap. There's been a lot of um, new thinking um, that's really changing what we think is, is appropriate. But <clears throat> we all the time have problems finding um, uh, housing in emergency settings and rapid rehousing and ability to put people in stable environments. That's the biggest ongoing issue. There are many other issues that have been um, brought to light uh, through COVID. And um, I hope <clears throat> that we never let a crisis go to waste and we start to address on a much broader basis the gaps in our social safety net that affect human trafficking and domestic violence victims because um, we're just seeing it exposed in, in such a big way. And just, you know, one that we haven't been dealing with is um, the, uh, the digital divide because, you know, as we've been talking with Dr. Gerald, you know, we may be at this distancing for some time going forward. What we do is face to face. Most of our services, almost all of our services are face to face. So we've transitioned to remote services, but many of our clients don't have the, the connectivity to be able to access this. So that's just something that we hadn't focused on before that is becoming a, a much uh, a much bigger issue and of course in this crisis all the basics are coming to fore like food and the issue of health insurance which is going to be a major issue as we see the effects of covid going going forward so there are many many issues yeah, i would agree about housing housing is the single biggest issue for as well every year the National Network to End Domestic Violence does a study and every year it shows that housing is the single greatest unmet need. I mean, particularly right now, um, having safe spaces for people to go into would be lovely if we could open hotels and distance people in that way um, in ways that would provide them with the basics. That would be incredible. I think France was doing that uh, for a little while. Uh, basic economic support, I still, I come back to this every time that I talk about this issue that if we were shoring people up economically, we would be decreasing rates of intimate partner violence, not just in the context of COVID, but always. 
um, good trauma-based interventions for both victims and for those who use violence. Um, our unwillingness or inability to intervene with people who are using violence, I think, is a huge mistake um, in terms of changing the people whose behavior it is that's causing the problem. And right now, when people can't be in face-to-face -face settings, how do we try to get people access to help, to services that can help them not use violence in this time? I think it is a huge issue. Um, but, and then the last thing I'd say is prevention. Um, exposure to violence is the, one of the biggest predictors of using violence as an adult. So not just thinking about intimate partner violence right now, but thinking about increased rates of child abuse and neglect that are going to have repercussions down the line for increased intimate partner violence years from now. Thank you. Alex, do we have another one? Yes, uh, Mark Dixon has our next question. Mark, are you with us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you for having us. Um, my name is Mark Dixon, Assistant Director, um, uh, Youth and Family Services. And uh, my question is, uh, with me running uh, programs for youth and families, is there anything that we can do specifically for the kids to assist them uh, through these trying times? I've had personally um, exper had personal experience with having to deal with kids that are coming from houses of uh, domestic violence. And also, is there something, um, my second question would be, is there anything from a training aspect that we can do for our young ladies, for our young men to actually help them to identify situations in which they may be trafficked, traffic, trafficked or um, any other resources that we could actually just hand out to the families in general? Who wants that one? Well, uh, Mark, I'll, I'll uh, start and just say thank you for raising that, and we'd love to work with you, and I'll follow up after this, this, uh, this uh, call. Um, but uh, I think the most important thing that we're seeing right now in the crisis is communication, intense communication, because isolation makes trafficking worse, because that's, that's what traffickers, that's their their tactics are isolation and confinement, and they're doing a number of things to take advantage of this to increase the vulnerability. So, uh, and you've got at the same time the situation <clears throat> where youth don't have face-to-face -face contact with people like you. So, uh, intense uh, communication with them now. Um, and number two, we would be happy to work with you on training that is adapted appropriately for the parents and others that you're talking about, um, because we think we're going to be doing um, online training in the next couple of months at a minimum where we would have done it in person, but it has to be adapted carefully so that, that the audiences that we're training are receptive to it. So we look forward to working with you on that. Professor Goodmark, anything to add? Yeah, I think this is a particularly hard question right now because there aren't resources that can take people out of spaces and kind of create the kind of distancing that might be useful for kids. So more than anything, providing a place for kids to talk, um, a safe and confidential space for them to talk about what's going on in their families, and then helping them think about safety planning. We talk about safety planning with victims of violence all the time. You know, how, do you have an emergency stash of money? Do you know where your documents are? Where would you go in case of a crisis? Who could you call that you could rely on? We never really talk about safety planning with kids in the same way, but for kids who are a little bit older, we can use that, that same set of skills to say, all right, so if something does start between your parents, is there a place you can go where you can get out of the way? And how can you kind of help yourself? Do you listen to music? Do you read? What are the strategies that you can use that help you to calm down, that help you to stay safe? There's so little. I think one of the things that's so frustrating about uh, intimate partner violence in the context of COVID is that there's so little that we can do. We don't do a ton now besides criminalization, but that at least felt like something that that one could do. Um, all of those strategies that you know that I've been talking about for years really require us to be able to space people apart and to get into families and to provide services. That's so so hard to do right now. But giving kids a confidential space where they can talk and helping them strategize about how to stay safe, I think, is a very concrete thing that you can provide. Yeah, just add to that, because thank you, Professor Goodmark, for raising that. I think safety planning is just a critical aspect right now. It's something that we do on an ongoing basis with 
our clients, um, because if the abuse accelerates, they need to have a plan, a place to go, a plan for getting there and to bring their documents. The other thing that we really are careful about is in sensitive situations is how we communicate and what we communicate when we know the person is with their trafficker. Um, so we'll want to know what their preferred form of communication is. And sometimes when we think someone is right there, we're very careful about what we say. Also, um, there are service providers who are fully engaged. We are at the Safe Center. And interestingly, one of the things that we have found is there's been a dramatically increased request for our mental health services. And all of this is being done now by phone. And not only is it with existing clients where we had already established a trust relationship, we're also doing this therapy with new clients that have come in and have only engaged with us on the phone. But sometimes having someone to talk to in that kind of professional setting can be very helpful. Great, thank you. Alex, we have another question or two I see. Well, yes, we have. I think we have at least one more. Um, we have an audience member who prefers not to speak, but says uh, this. Ambassador Esserman made a good point about the support network being gone right now. I help in the school system, and that makes me sad because those students or staff that had support or a safe place at school from abuse of all kinds, violence, neglect, and such, what should now be their support network, especially when they can't get to a phone or call 911, they can't leave the house due to a stay-at-home order? What do they do? Well, there, as I said, there are, first of all, Child Protective Services is, is operating. Uh, not, they're not, I think they're largely not doing face-to-face, in-person meetings, but they are available. I don't know, you know, as we take steps to open schools, you know, hopefully there's a way that we can uh, continue our work with the schools as we were doing training. Um, professionals in the school so that they're able to spot um, uh, human trafficking. But there are a number of agencies in the trafficking field that are operating remotely. And we would welcome, um, you know, we, we are bringing in new clients. Um, but I think systemically it's a huge issue right now because that network is not in place and there is a transition underway. But what we're hoping is that we can engage with school officials. We're working with CPS now to try to figure out how to adjust our work and engagement to, to help to address a tiny bit uh, the situation you rightly raise. I also think that, that there are a number of families who fear the intervention of Child Protective Services. Um, who you know know that, for example, families of color are vastly overrepresented in child protective services. That it's not always viewed as a helping system, and I, it makes me think a lot about the capacity of communities and our role as an anchor institution in our community um, to help to provide some of those services in a different kind of way. Now, understanding that people have responsibilities as mandated reporters. I do wonder if there's a way for some of our students in the through their clinical placements and other kinds of things to provide an outlet for people who need to talk, but maybe who aren't at the point where a mandated report would be necessary, or um, there's a way to kind of build community services in around people. Um, I think that that's something that I know the law school is thinking about a lot is, you know, what are we doing in response to COVID and how can we better serve our clients? And I have a feeling the other schools are thinking about that as well. And I think as, as the response goes on and as our students come back in the fall, um, I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to develop more resources like that. Because right now, there really isn't a great option, particularly for kids um, who aren't being seen by anybody but their families right now. And if those families are dangerous places, there's not much we can do, to be perfectly honest. It's just hard to imagine that your family is a dangerous place. It's like a mindset change for me. Not something I would ordinarily consider. Well, you know, the statistics show that family members are the largest perpetrators of child sex trafficking. It's really pretty shocking and depressing. That is, that is. Alex, we have another question. Yes, we have uh, Caitlin Bernitas. Uh, Caitlin, are you there? 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, um, thank you all for um, this discussion, uh, this enlightening discussion. Um, as you all have mentioned, and we've, we've all had a shift to working remotely, and victim services programs have had to shift their own programs to adjust to this. But as you all have pointed out, many of the problems human trafficking and gender violence survivors face are different than they usually face, considering isolation is becoming more and more of a problem. How are your programs innovating and plan on innovating in the following months? I can, I'll go short because we are, it, the law school clinical program is kind of an odd bird in this setting. Um, we, we are a direct service provider, but a very limited direct service provider. What we are thinking about is how can we make contact with our existing clients using um, either technology or we have gone back to snail mail in many cases. Um, I have written more letters in the last month that, to incarcerated people than I've written in the, probably the last five years since we can't see people. Um, we're trying to prioritize our work based on the people who are at gravest risk. And so really focusing on, for example, in my work, who are the survivors that we represent who uh, we might have the ability to get released from incarceration based on some of the emergency orders that have been put into place by the courts and by the executive. Um, but we're a very small service provider, and so I would defer to Ambassador Esserman on this one because they really do much more. I would also say, though, the law school has the Roar Center, which is doing a tremendous amount of direct service work um, and is a wonderful resource in the community as well. Ambassador? The, um, I think there's going to be, uh, we, we will at the SAFE Center be uh, working with students in the semester going forward. It will be in a different way. Right now, um, even as we closed, um, or, excuse me, never closed, we, we transitioned to remote services. We had a, um, a, a, a master's student, clinical uh, social services student working with us um, and in the last month of her uh, term, she was supporting the online services. I would just say um, it will be different. It, the the uh, services internships, if we're still in social distancing, will be different. But the needs of our clients are much higher than they have been in ordinary times because, as I reviewed, there are just so many different kinds of needs all these new rent issues, all of the issues of employment insurance and what are your rights to work. And uh, so um, I do think that you can still have a good clinical experience and learn working under professionals at the SAFE Center um, and really help to serve clients because there's a lot to research. There's a lot to think about, about how you engage with clients. And as I said, you know, some of our services have been more successful online. I've just been stunned by that. I mentioned mental therapy, mental health services, the therapy services. Um, you know, I think it's easier to access in an interesting way. Um, of course, just being on the phone is not as personal as direct face-to-face, -face, but ordinarily there's so much time for the survivor to come meet face to face and go back home or wherever they are and for the professional. And now it's, it's, it's in some ways less barriers for accessing. So we um, take, again, never letting a crisis go to waste. We are taking this as a challenge to how we can, citing Governor Cuomo, build back better, how we can learn from being remote how we can see what works and doesn't work from, provide, from, from providing remote services. What of that we're going to carry on um, in, in the new world and what we should, uh, we should not carry on. So we view this as um, a huge challenge, but an also an opportunity to listen to our clients, to try to better serve their needs and see if technology and other ways that we're engaging with them now will better serve their their interests great, great points ambassador and in fact they all apply to the university as well we're learning what we can do online at least as well and in some cases even better so it's it's a it's a new world for us learning all these things 
Professor Goodmark, anything to add to that? Only that we are in the same position as everybody else. We are scrambling and we're trying to figure this out as we're doing it. Um, and so I, it's funny, I was kind of reflecting on my answer and thinking, gosh, that was probably incredibly unsatisfying um, that I can't tell you necessarily how it's going to change. I know what I'm trying to do today for the client today, and I'm hopeful, um, as Ambassador Esterman said, that we'll have an opportunity to reflect on what's working and what's not. But to a certain extent, you know, we're in crisis mode um, with our clients, and I don't know that I've been as thoughtful yet about what might change as I'd like to be. Um, when the courts come back online, when it, right now, you know, we don't even have access to courts for most kinds of things. So, you know, what's that going to look like? Um, will we continue doing protective order cases or will we leave that to the people who've really figured out how to do them well during the time that the courts have been down? I just haven't thought through all of that yet. And I think, you know, acknowledging, I think as professionals that we can't do all of these things at once, um, is really important that for me, client service and in this crisis mode of I am just trying to get sick women out of prison before they get this virus and die. That's where my time has been spent. Um, and I'm going to keep doing that until I get some time to, to sit back and not worry about that being my immediate issue and then reflect a little bit. And that's OK. Um, it's OK to be in crisis mode right now, so long as we remember to take that time when we can to try to think through what has worked for us and what hasn't. Yeah. Great point. And I don't like to use words like crisis mode, but we're certainly scrambling to keep all of our programs going and effective uh, and, and serving all of our, our members as well. So, Frank, I see you have, or uh, uh, um, Alex, I see you have another question. I go by Frank too, that's fine. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, we have an interesting question from another anonymous uh, audience member who raises issue that uh, garnered a lot of attention during the uh, race for the Democratic convention, uh, Democratic uh, nomination for president, universal basic income. She says, she asks, does, uh, do you think UBI would make an impact in terms of emancipating people experiencing violence? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I think putting economic resources into people's hands will stop some violence, and I think that it will empower those who live in violent situations to be able to get out of those violent situations if economics is what's keeping them trapped. Universal basic income absolutely would have a positive impact on intimate partner violence, no doubt in my mind. Strong opinion there, Ambassador. <laughs> I think that this, the, the, the looking at the effects of the COVID crisis just reinforces how we really need to fundamentally change our social safety net. So I, that's something that I think we should be looking at very, very closely. Thank you. Alex, do you have another question there? Well, we, have a, we have a comment, I think. Uh, Courtney Fisher is, has raised uh, an issue. Courtney, if you're there, do you want to, uh, you want to mention what you, what you wrote to me? Sure, I am. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so I, uh, I, what I put in the comment box was that I work for an organization that serves the greater Washington region in Maryland. So Montgomery, Prince George's, we go up to Howard, um, Frederick, really anywhere um, that we're asked to go. Um, and we provide um, age appropriate intimate partner violence prevention programming for ages fourth grade through college. Um, so kind of teaching young kids what healthy relationships look like um, and how to talk to adults about them if something is happening in their home. And then going through college, even teaching college students what healthy relationships look like, but also what healthy workspaces look like. Um, since they're going into the workforce. Um, and if anyone is interested in any of that, um, I, our website is jcada.org, jcada.org. Um, and, you know, happy to work with anyone who might be interested. So I'll just say, uh, one of the things that I talk about in my book quite a bit is the importance of exactly those kinds of programs. and. 
In the world of intimate partner violence, sometimes the research is not as great as one would hope, but one place where the research is really, really strong is around the ability of prevention programs like that to make a significant difference in both teen dating violence and in adult relationship violence. So I'm a huge fan. Alex, do we have another question? Yes, we have one. Uh, we have uh, another anonymous uh, questioner. Uh, she writes uh, that abuse can take many forms, physical, mental, emotional. What resources are available for those who may not be experiencing physical violence, but are still impacted by emotional or mental abuse? And, and that's got to be so prevalent now that people are locked at home, often with the people who are tormenting them. Yeah, and my clients, you know, I've been representing victims of violence for about 25 years, and my clients have consistently said emotional abuse is worse than physical abuse. It is so much more destructive. It is what dismantles you as a person, uh, that no one wants to get hit, no one wants to get hurt, but that the emotional abuse is worse. So my heart goes out to anybody who's experiencing that. Um, the one, you know, as a lawyer, one of the hard things for us is that there are very, very few legal remedies that get to emotional abuse. Um, generally in the law, what the law will deal with is physical abuse or threats of physical abuse, but not kind of emotional, psychological abuse, not economic abuse, not spiritual abuse, other forms of abuse that people are experiencing. And so um, a couple of resources that I would mention, one is the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, and the hotline is a wonderful resource if you need somebody to talk to about what you're experiencing. Um, the hotline is there. The Roar Center at Maryland um, has social workers that are doing this kind of work. Um, the, you know, dealing with emotional abuse is not something that lawyers do very often, but it is something that we engage with our partners to deal with all the time. Um, and I can't, again, I can't recommend the hotline strongly enough for people who are experiencing emotional abuse. Um, actually, under the trafficking law, emotional um, abuse is covered because I 100% agree uh, with Professor Goodmark that emotional abuse can be much worse than, than physical abuse. Um, and it's cut, we just last year, was it last year? Uh, yes, last year, we finally in Maryland uh, passed a state uh, trafficking, labor trafficking law, the first time it criminalizes labor trafficking. And one of the things that we were actively involved at the SAFE Center and in, in, in pushing that forward and uh, involved in the drafting, and we really pushed hard to have exactly that issue contained in the state legislation to mirror actually what's in uh, the federal legislation. Yes, and I also agree that about the lack of resources in this area. I am very glad, and it's why we put a lot of priority at the Safe Center on providing um, mental health therapy uh, services. But, uh, you know, and we get, sometimes we will just have a, a client referred just for that services because we're one of the few organizations that pro that provide it. But there is, there are so many different um, services that may be required depending on the nature of um, the emotional issues. And so, you know, uh, this is, this is, I should have put that on the list of my, the big issues when you, uh, when you asked uh, early on, but this is, this is a big issue for, I think in both of our fields. Alex, we have one or two more questions. I believe. Sure. We have uh, Aisha Mutani. Aisha, are you there? Hey, yes, I am here. You hear me? Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you everyone. It's great discussion and thank you Dr. Gerald for having this topic. It's really interesting. And I learned through a lot of from this discussion. So my question, we are like focusing on other places, but like my question, it was related to our home, which is UMB, or like how would we prevent violence at workplace against employees, and especially women, and who, how make employees aware of this and we can manage it with them in confidential manner. And uh, one of the doctors was mentioning an important point that some people sometimes they are worried about losing jobs, but they are damaged like, you know, emotionally. So if there is any resources or anything that people would be aware and then we can prevent all this at workplace. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question, Aisha, and and I think my first reaction to it would be, 
if that's happening at UMB, somebody needs to hear about it and we would need to take action. Uh, be, because I think uh, President Perman before me and certainly I myself as well, have no tolerance for that type of, certainly physical is just unthinkable to me. I can see how emotional could be just as destructive, uh, but, but I would simply say if that's if that kind of thing is going on, someone needs to hear about it. And, and that someone could be the Title IX office. Yes. Um, so if what you're experiencing you believe to be gender-based um, violence or discrimination, the Title IX office is a fantastic resource for bringing those complaints uh, to someone at UMB whose job it is to investigate those and address them. And if it's not Title IX, I, I suspect the HR office would be where you would start. But you should get action on that. Aisha, you, you, you talked about having two expert attorneys here. I have to tell you, as the crusty old surgeon, it's always wonderful for me to hear a group of learned professors talk about a topic that I knew little about. And of course, this has been another good example of that. Uh, Alex, do you have any other questions? Uh, I do. I, you know, I'm a little, I, now that I see this one from the Sumerahe, I'm surprised that it hasn't come up uh, earlier. Uh, Sumer, are you uh, with us? Yes. Go ahead, please. Um, hi. My question was, uh, how do you think that the new Title IX rules will impact victims of sexual violence? And um, what resources would you point victims to now that reporting to schools and universities will become stricter? Um, I think that it, the new Title IX rules are likely to chill reporting for obvious reasons. I think that um, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if people choose to stop using those kinds of resources. And, you know, the real the, the shame in that and shame is not a strong enough word is that Title IX provided a nice alternative for people who weren't interested in criminalization. And what the new rules do is make the Title IX system more like a criminal trial, which is what a lot of people were trying to avoid in the first place. So um, thinking again about community-based resources, what are the community-based sexual assault and, and intimate partner violence service providers can do that work. Now, as an employee of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, I have to say, if there is sexual harassment or sexual assault occurring on campus or in a campus setting, um, you should call Title IX. And as a lawyer for the people who are experiencing that, I, I will say, I know that many people are not going to do that and don't want to do that. Um, know that if you talk to people in the university setting, we are all mandated reporters. And so if you tell us these things, we must go to Title IX with them. So you need to know that which is why it's important to know what the community-based resources are as well. The Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence um, and the Sexual Assault Legal Institute and MCASA, the Maryland um, Coalition Against Sexual Assault, have tons of resources. If you are not interested in going through the Title IX system, um, which I, I truly believe fewer people will at this point. Alex, looks like you still got questions there. No, it's, uh, it, we had a lot of questions. Uh, here's one that's sort of specific for our audience. Um, the uh, questioner asks, what are some specific things that we as a UMB community can do to help women struggling during this time? Be available as someone who can talk to someone and provide them with an outlet for the things that they want to know about. Know where the resources are so that if somebody asks you where to go, you have some sense of where that might be. And again, for intimate partner violence, the Maryland Network has great resources. The National Domestic Violence Hotline has great resources. Um, be willing to be part of a mutual aid program if that means, as I said, you know, taking somebody a meal so that that doesn't become the point of contention for an evening. That's a good thing to do. I think we've we have grown into a system that suggests to us that we shouldn't intervene ever in violence and that we shouldn't become involved because we have a criminal legal system and we have a civil legal system and that's who should do this. But that system is not really accessible right now and for lots of people who may not want to use it, not an option. And so we have to go back to thinking as communities about how it is that we can be supportive. We also have to be thoughtful about how we do that because sometimes when we intervene, we can make people less safe and not more safe. And there's no science to this. 
right? There's no, there's no set of steps that I could give you that would guarantee a good outcome. So a lot of it is just being attentive to what people are telling you they need. Don't tell them what they need. They don't need that from you. Listen and help people try to figure out what their options are. A lot of what we do when we counsel clients is just generating options and generating pros and cons and helping people try to figure out what the best option in a bad situation is. And that's something you can always do for someone else. Great, thank you. Alex, maybe one last question. Pick it wisely. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to turn the mic on for Trisha O'Neill. Uh, I don't know if she wants, wisely. <laughs> I don't know if she wants to speak, but I'm going to I'm going to sort of uh, make her speak if she can. Trisha, are you there? One thing I want to remind the UMB community about is the whistleblower hotline. Um, and I should, could start to use that anonymously um, if she wanted to phone in at eight six six five. Nine four five two two zero. She will not speak to a UMB employee, um, and she could start there. Um, I'll give it to you again later, Ambassador. Or she can file electronically, um, and that's just a way that another input instead of uh, uh, in addition to the Title IX office. My question is: um, the Chief Judge just said that there will be no resumption of jury trials until July twentieth and the courts will remain closed, but for emergencies until June 5th. So how is the lack of access to the courts um, fitting into this? Um, because it's it's unheard of. Yeah, I mean, on, on the very most emergency level, domestic violence protective orders, for example, are still being heard. So you can get into the court to get that kind of immediate relief. It's playing out more in, for example, custody cases where people don't want to do custody transfers because of concern about exposure to the virus or or for incarcerated folks, you know, you're sitting and you're sitting and you're sitting without sometimes without. Um, well, if you're pretrial, always without having been proven guilty of anything um, and your time for exposure is growing and growing. And that's obviously a huge issue. Um, it is almost impossible to get into court on an emergency motion in a family law case right now, which means that some things that maybe didn't need to escalate will um, in ways that I think are problematic. And just from the standpoint of human trafficking, many of our, our remedies are not in court or certainly not in state court. Um, and I would say that uh, we're still worried nonetheless because there's been such a delay under this administration in processing and evaluating those petitions that are critical to the livelihoods of human trafficking uh, victims and we fear that w there will be a uh, greater delay. Uh, there have been many um, barriers interposed in the legal system, particularly in the immigration um, area. So with limited resources, a lot no on uh, no in person services this is this is a potential issue although since this is the last question i'd really like to end on a positive note we were thrilled to receive um, a uh, an approval of a t visa application uh, in a very short period of time that a t visa gives trafficking victims the right to be here legally and the authorization to work and it's 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 critical to um, to their livelihood. And, um, you know, th this was especially welcome because uh, under this administration, the time frame for these have gone from like eight months to two years and ours was done in like nine months. So, um, so some things are still happening, um, but there are many worries, which Professor Goodmark uh, outlined as well. Well, I want to thank the participants, those of you who uh, were online, I really appreciate it. Uh, and to Ambassador Esserman and Professor Goodmark, wow, what a great discussion. Always learn a lot and always feel like there's a lot more to do in this university, this city, and this state. So thank you again for your time. And uh, I look forward to inviting you all here next week. I think we're going to have um, Dr. Kathy Newsel to talk about the clinical trials, the vaccine trials, uh, and other trials related to COVID. So until then, I'll look forward to seeing you. Thank you and, and good afternoon.